Hi, and welcome to this new Geometry Gem where uh, we're going to discuss like a, a bunch of different sorting algorithms that we're going to use to sort a point cloud uh, by different criteria. So for example, uh, we have this point cloud that is absolutely random. And if we join them with a polyline, you can see that the polyline is just zigzagging all around the place with no order just because the points don't really have an order between them. But if I choose to sort them by X, uh, property, for example, you can see that now the polyline is sorted in the X direction, or I can choose, for example, to change this to sort them in the Y direction. So now you can see that the accordion kind of polyline is going in that direction. Or if we could also choose to sort them by Z height, and then all the points are going from the minimum to the maximum Z height. But at the same time, we can sort them by other criteria that is not just Euclidean location, but can be, for example, by proximity. We can choose to join all the points uh, one by one, the ones that are closer to each other. So for example, here, what I, you can see is that all the, the polyline that we create over all these points sorted by proximity, it creates now like um, a polyline where points are joined by the ones that are much closer to each other. But we can also choose to choose to, to, um, uh, to sort by the ones that are farthest apart. And if we do that, it basically creates this sort of like sea urchin kind of geometry, which I find really interesting. Uh, the algorithms that we're going to discuss are very simple. Uh, we're not going to get into hardcore sorting algorithms in computer science. We're more, much more, I'm much more interested in the geometry results that we generate. Um, and we're going to implement this in C Sharp using Rhino and Grasshopper, which is a visual programming environment that allows scripting in C Sharp. We're almost going to use no native uh, grasshopper uh, properties, so nothing from Rhino Common. So if you are working on any other C Sharp environment, or if you're working on with any other programming language, you will have a very easy time rewriting these algorithms and adapting them to whichever system you're, you're, you're working on. All right, so let's get done. Let's get busy with this. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with some code that I wrote already for the previous geometry gem that I did, uh, geometry gem number five, where we were, uh, where we wrote an algorithm to take a point cloud and then to clean up the duplicate points or to clean it up from points that were very close to each other. Okay, so if you remember from that gem, I wrote this simple. Um, Grasshopper script. So Grasshopper is a visual programming environment that you can use to generate geometry procedurally. And then what this script does is it generates a set of 1000 random points, I can increment this or make it slower, or make it lower, but we can increment we can do, um, we could just create a 1000 random points inside of a cube that is two by two by two side. Okay, if you're interested in learning how to how I made this, uh, just go back to um, that video, which will probably be on the description or popping up somewhere here. And then just check this out. Um, but if you don't have this, uh, or what you have is a CSV file where you have like a million of points, or whatever, then just like whatever code you have that you can write to make these points accessible as a sorted list. That's the point that where we want to start. So here, I have a component that just has um, if I drop a, a list here, it just has a ordered list of XYZ coordinates for each one of those points. And these coordinates are wrapped into a point class. So uh, whether if you have a point class on the, whatever system you're using or not, uh, it's up to you, but it's a very simple thing that you can do. And uh, it's very easy to make to them manipulate them. Okay, so I'm going to start from this point, I'm going to assume that you have a list of however many points that form a cloud. Here I have a visual representation of where they are. And uh, the point of what we're going to do today is that if I were to, for example, write an algorithm to create a polyline between these points, this polyline will be basically a mess, just because these points are in any random order, uh, whichever order they were generated, because we generated them randomly, there's no order and there's no structure. So it just looks like a, like a yarn of points, whatever. So what we want to do is we want to take these points and sort them by a particular logic. Um, so that we can, we could, for example, afterwards create a polyline that had like a different visual flavor because the points are ordered in three dimensional space. Uh, in this 
video, I think what we're going to do is we're going to order them by X, Y, or Z coordinate. So like, like sweeping them in one Euclidean direction. Um, and I think we're also going to uh, sort them by proximity. So we're going to grab one random point, the first one on the list, and then we're going to start ordering them by whichever other point in the point cloud is closest to that previous point. And therefore that will create a polyline that will start joining points that are very close to each other and give it like a very different flavor, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I'm here, I'm writing this in Grasshopper. Uh, I'm going to create a Grasshopper C sharp, C sharp scripting component so that I can write custom C sharp code inside of it. So here, um, I'm going to rename this input to points. I'm going to remove this other input. I'm going to make sure that this input is of the type point 3D so that objects are correctly casted into the object. And then here, the output, I'm going to call it sorted points. All right, and that one I don't need to cast. I'm going to turn this polyline off. And then once I'm ready, then I can just double click on my component and start writing C sharp code inside of here. Uh, if you're writing this in some other C sharp environment, the translation is going to be super immediate because I'm not going to be using any of the Rhino common um, um, methods. Or if you're writing this in a different language like Python, JavaScript, whatever, then all the technologies and all the methods that I'm going to be using are going to be very easy to translate to that other language, okay? But as usual, before we start writing any code, the first thing that we need to do is we need to think with our heads about what we're going to do. And some planning and some sketching uh, is probably going to be in order. So let me draw a couple of diagrams and explain uh, how we're going to tackle this algorithm. The first one being ordering them, for example, by their x coordinates from, from the smaller one to the larger one. Okay, so let's get to the whiteboard. So in order to explain this, let us imagine that we have a list of sorted of unsorted points, okay? And I'm going to represent that list, which this amazingly designed uh, lines that I've done here, at least this time, I'm not, they're not squiggly lines. They're like perfect straight lines. I'm getting much better at this, right? And um, so this, each one of these lines represent a point in three dimensional space. And each one of them has um, whatever location. So what we, and also because it's an order list, remember that um, remember that each one of these points within our list has an index number. So if I go back to um, to Grasshopper, we can see here visually that each one of the points has zero, one, two, three, four. This is the index number. It always starts at zero, and it's always correlative by one unit. Okay. And um, but if you had this on a non-visual environment, it's fine. You still can use those numbers to point to these particular points. Um, and each one of these points is going to have three properties, X, Y, and Z coordinates. And because we're gonna start, for example, sorting them by the X coordinate, we don't really care about the other ones. So each one of these points is going to have, for example, an X coordinate with whichever value. I just wrote some random numbers there. And because they're random points, they don't follow any order, as opposed to the index number, which is always order. Okay, so here um, in this list, each one of these points have an whatever random x value. And our purpose is to write an algorithm that is going to take all these points and create a new list where all these points are sorted from 0 to 9 by their x coordinate from the smaller one to the larger one. So what we're going to do is we're going to write an algorithm that is going to start going over this list one time for each one of these points is going to find for every time we loop over this list is going to find the point that has the smallest x coordinate at any given time. And then it's going to move that point to a new list. And then because as we're moving them, and they as they get added to the new list, they're going to get added by whichever is smaller. Okay. So how is that going to happen? Well, it's going to be super easy. What we're going to do is first, here, we're going to look at, we're going to do uh, a first pass over the whole list. And we're going to find which one is the one that has the lowest x value. And the way we do that is going to be super simple. We're going to start with, uh, I'm going to create a variable in while well, doing my algorithm 
that I'm going to call something like, for example, current minimum x. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to use that variable to check when I'm checking each point uh, to check which one is the lowest x value that I have found while going through any of these uh, any of these points. So for example, imagine that um, I start this current x minimum x with a really large number. So for example, like 1 million. All right, I'm going to start with 1 million. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an algorithm that starts with the first point of that list. And it looks at the x coordinate. And it says, is the x coordinate this one? Is it smaller than my current minimum? And if that condition is true, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if that's true, then I'm going to replace the current minimum that I had, which was a really large number, with the last value that I found, 1.5. And as I do that, I'm also going to keep track of where I found that point. So I'm going to create another variable that I'm going to call, for example, current uh, i. And I'm going to make that, I'm going to turn that into zero. Um, that is not great. Let me, re let me redraw this. All right, this looks better now. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was saying we check, we found the first one, uh, we found it was smaller than any other one. And so we store the value that we have found 1.5 and we store where we have found it in, at position zero. Then what we do is we check the next one. And as we check the next one is 2.4 greater than the minimum value that we have found before. So is this greater than 1.5? It is not. So if it's not, then it doesn't work. We skip it, right? So we don't want to care. So do we check the next one? Is 3.7 smaller than what we have found so far, 1.5? It is not. So we skip to the next one. Is 0 0.6 smaller than anything we have found before? Yes. So if that's the case, then what we do is we remove the 1.5 and now we store here at current minimum x we store 0 0.5 as the minimum value that we have found. And we also store in the other variable where we have found it. So that was at position number three. So we keep doing over and over this and over and over again. And if you look at the, the, the table, what would probably end up happening is by the end, well, after checking all the 10 points, we will end up having that the current minimum value that we have found is minus 2.7 and that the next and that the index number where that happened was number five. So if that's the case, then what we do now is after we have finished the first round, what we do is we take this point here, we take 0 0.5 and then we move it to the new list. So this is going to be the new list where it becomes object number zero at coordinates 0 0.7. Okay, and then we remove this object from the list, therefore, and therefore all these numbers rename to 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we have a list with one less element. All right, let me redraw this in a way that looks a little better. Okay, so I think this looks a little better. So that's my new list, the one on the right that has the first element that we found with the smallest x. And now this is the remainder list, which is the same list that I had before, but I have removed the element that was in this position. Okay, oh, my finger. <laughs> the element that was right there. Now there's a gap and all these numbers here, five, six, seven, and eight. Now these are the reordered indices that just have reordered automatically because of the fact that I have removed one element from there. Okay, uh, remember that the new element on the new list, the new point becomes element number zero just because um, it's um, just because it's, um, it's, it's, it's the first one on the list. So that was the first pass that we did on the list. And then what we're going to do is we're going to keep doing passes and passes and passes until we empty the full list of points. And but every time we start a new pass, we need to do a couple things. We need to uh, make sure that we reset 
um, we need to make sure that we reset these values because if we start with minus 2.7 when we start with the next round, then no point is going to have an x property smaller than minus 2.7. That was the smallest one we found. So we need to reset this to some kind of very large value. Again, let's start, for example, with 1 million or something. And the current index, it's common practice to use, for example, minus 1, because minus 1 is a number that can never be an index number. So if we, if we ended up writing some code and after the loop, for some reason, the current index was still minus 1, we would know that something went wrong that something just didn't work out. So that's why it's a good flag to keep track of whether if we have found something. So again, we would do the same thing again right now. So we would do is like we would start with the first point. The first point is 1.5 is less than 1 million. So we would do 1.5 and then we would store number zero here. The next one 2.4, 2.3, not at all. We keep, we stay with two, zero point. The next one we find is 0 0.6 and then index is number three. And then the next one is minus 1.3 and index number four, which if we keep going down the list is the last one that we find. So what we would do is now we would, once we have found, once we have an iterating, we just take this point, we move it here. This becomes point number one on, and then with a coordinate of minus 1.3. And as we go into the next loop, we do the same thing again. We initialize this again to a very large number, 1 million and minus 1. And we keep this doing over and over again until we end up with a new list that has all the elements sorted one after the other, okay, by their x coordinate. So this is conceptually what we're going to do. And we're going to follow the same looping approach, the same like taking the same idea of like using a variable that keeps track of the last value that we found that that matched the criteria for sorting that we're trying to use and using another variable to keep, another variable to keep track of where we found that point on the list this is the core of the the technique that we're going to use for these algorithms to sort now whether if the criteria is going to be the x coordinate the y coordinate if it's smaller or greater than the last one we found or if it's the distance between points, that will change depending on the algorithm. But the same iterative looping over and over and taking points and moving them from one list to the new one, that's going to be uh, the core of what we're going to do for all the algorithms, okay? So now take a, let's take a look at how that would be written in actual code terms. Let's go back to, um, to coding. Wonderful. So back on Grasshopper, I'm going to open my C Sharp script component and I'm going to access the main function, which is the one that takes all the points as a list, which I, by the way, I forgot. I need to right click here and make sure that I, I click list access. So instead of having one point at a time, when I click here, I actually do have as an input to the function, I have a list of point 3D objects. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is going to be super easy. I'm going to create an empty list to store sorted points. So that's going to be uh, a list of point 3D elements. So new points, for example, or S points, sorted points. And this is going to be a new list that I'm going to initialize empty. And it's going to be of the type point 3D because I'm working in Grasshopper that has a struct that is point 3Ds. But if you're working on any other environment, you can use any, you can use any class that has XYZ properties or something like that. And then here, I'm going to also going to create the two variables that I'm going to use to keep track of um, of the most uh, the, the, of the criteria that I'm that I'm using. So, for example, I'm going to create uh, variables to keep track of checks, and I'm going to say, for example, I'm going to use a number uh, for for minimum x. And I'm going to use another number for um, minimum index. Actually, I'm going to, why, why not calling them just like we did? So current minimum x and current index. Let's just do just like we did on the diagram, okay? Current index is not a double, it's an integer. And I'm going to initialize it to minus one as I did in the diagram. And then current minimum x 
Uh, I could just initialize it to a, ra a ridiculously large number. Um, but it's common practice to actually um, use some kind of system variable that can give us the largest number that can be stored, for example, on a double. So I believe in C sharp, the way you do that is double dot, and then you access here this property called max value. And if you're curious about what that value is, I can just print that to uh, current minimum x to string. I can print that to the console. And if I run this, uh, I can post a panel here. I can place a panel here and that value in C sharp is, um, is like 1.7976 with 308 zeros afterwards. Okay. Uh, so this is an exponent. This is an exponential notation. This means this number times 10 elevated to 308. So, or otherwise, this number, but instead of with the decimal point here, with 308 um, um, zeros afterwards. Okay. So um, if you are working on any other environment, maybe you have access to something like this. Otherwise, just write any very large number here that you think is going to be always bigger than any of the X locations that you can find on the points that you're bringing in. Okay. And then here, what we're going to do is we're going to write a for loop that is going to iterate over all the points. So there's two ways we can do this. Uh, we can just write a for loop. Uh, for example, int i equals zero, i is going to be less than um, uh, s points dot count. So the amount of points, sorry, the amount of points in the list that is coming in. So this one, and i plus plus. And remember, we're doing this because every time we iterate, um, every time we iterate, uh, we're going to iterate one time per the amount of points that we have. Okay, so we're going to need to do this, like if we have 10 points, so 10 times, if we have a million points, then a million times. And then what we do is, um, once we are here, then we're going to write another for loop, j equals zero, j is less than, uh, than how many points are left here. Sorry, j. And then with this one, this is the one that we use to go over each one of the, um, each one of the, um, uh, each one of the points on the list. So remember, we need to, we need to make the process of checking all the points, we need to make it 10 times. And then every time we check the list, we also check it however many times there's items on that list. Okay. So um, actually, that is not correct. Is that correct? That is not correct. Let me take a pause here. Okay, I think I was accelerating a little bit. Um, I may have had actual caffeine in my coffee a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, but let me backtrack. So we're not going to do it exactly this way. So what we're going to do is, what we're going to say is, I want to keep checking the, the list of points that was given so long as there are any points on that list. So a better way to go about that is by using a while loop, where we can say while points dot count is greater than zero. So as long as on my original list, there are still points remaining, I'm going to keep doing these checks. Okay. And then here inside. So um, as long as we have points, keep checking. And then here, I'm going this is where I'm going to declare uh, my variables. So current maximum x is going to be equal to double dot max value and int is going to be current index is going to be minus one and then here now for each time i check now that's where i want to have a for loop that goes from the first point to all the points on the list finds which one is the minimum value stores it and then moves that point to the the new the new list so here i'm going to do for int i is less than zero i is less than however many points i have on the list so point count 
and then i plus plus and then here for each point what i'm going to do is if points if points if the element i so each one of them if the x coordinate of that point is less than the current max the current minimum x that i need to change if this is true then this is the point that becomes the new minimum so what i do is i can say um, current minimum x is going to be equal to the x coordinate of that point that i just found and the current index is going to be equal to that index, the number in which I just found it. So if I do that, that's also, that's going to start working. But then before I exit, before I need to remember to take one point from this list, the one that I found that was the smallest one, remove it from points and add it to the new list that I'm, where I'm keeping track of those sorted points. So this, I'm going to call this sorted. And because otherwise, if I don't remove those points, I may actually get trapped on an infinite loop because this, if I don't remove points, this is going to be always, um, always greater than zero. So it's never going to stop. There's a, when using while loops is usually a bit more dangerous because it's sometimes if you don't remember to write things correctly, you can get trapped on infinite loop and then you have to like the computer crashes, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's not great. So what I can say is let me add to the list of sorted add whichever points in points at whichever point was the smallest one that I found. So the one that is going to be at index, current index. Okay. And then from points, then remove the point that is at current index. So let me put some annotations here. Iterate over all remaining points and find the one with the smallest x coordinate. And now move that point to sorted list and remove it from original list. Let's see if this works. Is this going to work? Oh, well, there's no errors, but also there's no sorted points because I haven't really uh, assign that yet. So uh, let me just write here the output sorted points is going to be equal to that list that I just created. And if I do this, I have a list of points. And let's check this out visually. Does this make sense? Minus. Oh, this looks like it could make sense. All right. So let's see if we can make that sense of that visually. So if I plug in here a, a list of vertices, this, um, okay. And we can see more or less, if I go to the top, we can see that now the polyline is ordered somehow. And it feels like it's sweeping the points from left to right. Okay. And if we do a front view, then it's probably going to get the same, a very similar visual. So, na -na. so that was it. So we have now taken um, all those points and we have sorted them out by X property. I think something that could be fun now would be to um, write the same, but give the user, whoever is calling this function, give the user the possibility of choosing whether if the points are going to be uh, sorted by X, by Y, or by Z coordinate, right? Uh, and instead of just hard coding that in the function, then maybe what we can do is like we can pass in a parameter, so the letter X, the letter Y, or the letter Z, and then use that as something that can inform how the algorithm sorts over these points. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to add a new input, and I'm going to call this coordinate and this is going to be of the type, for example, we could use numbers. So we could use zero for X, one for Y and Z for two or two for Z. Uh, but I think it's actually easier to just do a string so that people can type, um, for example, the letter. 
So people can type, for example, the letter Z, and then that's what becomes the input here. Okay. Um, and then let's go back into the code. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to inside of the code, we're going to write some small code to be able to discriminate between us, um, <clears throat> which is the coordinate that we're going to, which is the coordinate that we're going to uh, take a look at here in this line of code. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to check the input coordinate and we're going to check whether if it's X, Y, or Z. And then we're going to keep track of that with an integer number inside of our code. We're going to do that just because um, comparing strings is a little trickier usually than comparing numbers. And computers have a much easier time comparing integer numbers um, especially integer numbers are very easy to compare and very fast. So what we're going to do is we're going to just write some code that looks at the string, make some comparisons and some safety checks. And, um, and if everything goes well, then we will use that number to then discriminate in the algorithm. So for example, so something that I can say is uh, check the input coordinate. So I'm going to create a, an integer value here that I'm going to name coordinate integer. And again, I'm going to initialize it to minus one because it's usually um, because if it's not because if it stays at minus one after the checks, then I can know that something went wrong. So what I can do is now I want to compare the coordinate and I want to say if coordinate and um, let me check how to write lower cases in C sharp. Yes, so the method to take a coordinate and turn it into uh, lowercase is going to be to lower. Uh, and remember, we want to do this because we want to give the user the possibility of having uppercase or lowercase inputs and not have an error. So whatever they give us, we just turn it to lowercase and we say, is this equal to the string x? If so, then coordinate integer is going to be equal to zero. Otherwise, uh, other, otherwise, if this is equal to y, then coordinate integer is going to be equal to 1. And then if this equals c, then this should be equal to 2. All right. But there is the possibility that the user um, just inputs something that is wrong. So we want to also make sure that we check that because otherwise we could have problems in our code. So, so what we can do is if the user did input something that was not an uppercase or a lowercase x, y, c, then this number at this point in the program is still minus one. So what I can do is I can say if coordinate integer is still minus one, then something went wrong. So I can say component, um, uh, add runtime message and then the grasshopper runtime message level level dot error uh, wrong coordinate input type. Okay, let's see this in action. So let me run this code right now. It's fine. It doesn't complain, but if I type something that it shouldn't be, it tells me wrong coordinate input type. So I'm going to go back to Z for example. Okay. Um, all right. And now that we're here, now what we can do is we can just some, write something in the code, something like, for example, this could be now, uh, I'm going to rename this to current minimum, because now it's not an X or a Y. And we want to write code that is a little cleaner. Uh, so I'm going to rename that current minimum here. And then what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to write a series of if else's. So if coordinate integer is zero, then what I want to do is I want to check for the x property, just like we have right now. Oh, I want to check for the x property. Okay. Now, um, otherwise, if the coordinate is one that I want to choose for the y coordinate here. Otherwise, uh, 
what did I do? Otherwise, if coordinate integer is 2, then what I want to check here is for coordinate z. Okay? Is that going to work? Let me check. So I'm going to run this code, and right now, uh, oh, something got messy, but if I do front view, you can see that things are now sorted by z coordinate, and if I replace this and I do y coordinate, you can see that the top view makes things order from x, lower x, so from y in this direction, and I capital X also makes things sorted in the x direction. So now we have an input, we have a component that can order um, points in any of the two directions. All right, um, how cool is that? <laughs> Before I go on, um, I also want to rewrite this in a way that is a bit more specific to the grasshopper environment because it just so happens that when we are here, the fact that every time we have to check if else, if else, uh, coordinate int, coordinate int, there's a lot of if else, if else checking. Um, so if this was a million points, it could be a little expensive. So um, in order to simplify this a little bit more, we can take advantage of one of the properties of Rhino common point 3D objects. And it is the fact that in, that in order to access the X, Y, and C property of a point, we can either do this by writing dot X, dot Y, or dot C, or we can also access the dot, uh, so we can also access with an, with, um, with an item access. So what that means is that, for example, if I write a random point, so for example, point, point 3D uh, P is going to be a new point 3D with whichever dimensions, it doesn't matter. If I do P, the point, and I open square brackets, you can see how I can use an integer 0, 1, or 2 to retrieve the x coordinate, the y coordinate, or the z coordinate. So it gives me an accessor kind of um, uh, ability to get into to get each one of the three coordinates by instead of writing dot x dot y dot c, just opening and closing square brackets and adding the number of the property that I want to access. 0 for x, 1 for y, and 2 for z. And because we just calculated that number here, then that can actually make our code a bit cleaner. So what I can do here is I can say I can, I'm going to clear all this up, okay? And I'm going to, and I'm going to now say, instead of dot z, what I'm going to use is I'm going to say, I'm going to open a square bracket. I'm going to say chord int, because this is a number that I calculated before. And I'm going to replace that here as well. If I run this code, things work exactly the same. But now if I replace this with a y value, then this adapts correspondingly. And if I do z, then it also changes. And the code is a little bit more optimized because we don't have to do so many if and else, if and else checks. We just did this one check here for sanity with the input. And now that's embedded in the coordinate that we actually have here. So, um, but we could only do that because that's a property that point 3D objects in Rhino Common uh, have. If you don't have the possibility on whichever environment you're working, then you may want to modify the point class that you're using here, or just stick to um, the version that I showed before. All right. Okay, so I think we are ready to um, leave this component now and create a new component with a similar technique where instead of choosing XYZ, what we do is we uh, sort them by proximity, by which points are, much, are closer to each other. Let's try that out. Okay, I have uh, re-sorted everything a little bit. So I took the component that we had before and I wrote here the name sort points by coordinates because like maybe if I'm writing a grasshopper plugin, like this could be like my new uh, point, my new component that I'm working on. And I copy pasted this and I made a very similar one that I'm going to call sort points by distance. And then this takes in the list of points. It spits out a sorted list of points. And right now it just has the placeholders for uh, a new empty list that is the sorted one 
and the output that will be win whenever we fill this in with all the points, okay? So we're going to do a very similar operation where what we're going to say is while all the points that we took, while this list is, sorry, is greater than zero, the, the amount of points that there are there, keep iterating, okay? But I'm going to cancel this out for the time being because if I do that, if I were to run this code, I would hit an infinite loop. Um, but we're going to break this down a little bit before. Before we start doing this, we need to take the first point that we're going to start checking. So what is that going to be? Um, well, um, we, need to, we need to say, um, we need to take the first point. Um, <clears throat> let me, okay, let me, <laughs> let me all right, sorry. Uh, let me go back to the whiteboard, okay? I need to explain something. Okay, the one thing that I need to explain for this algorithm is a slight change that we're going to do. And it is the fact that before, when we were checking the list for X coordinates, something that happened was that all points are always going to have the exact same X coordinates because points are not going to change. So the property that we're using to compare, we can call it static because no matter what we're doing or where we are in the program, the X coordinate never changes. So it's a bit easier to do. We need to keep track of less things. However, if what we intend to do is we take one point and then calculate all the distances to all the points around it, find which one is the minimum, and then use that, take that point and become and make it the next one that we check, then what happens is that all the distances for the next iteration of checks are different because they're not the distances from the previous point. They are the distances from the new point that we just picked up. So we need to recalculate all those distances. And therefore, the list of things that changes, the list of those numbers is going to change with every iteration of the checks. So something that we would need to add here to the current index would be like a new variable called, for example, current point or last point or something like that, where every time we check, we check um, the distance from the current point to all the other points, we take the one that is the smallest and then we store that point. Um, so um, this is going to be a slight difference. So keep in mind, and I think we're actually going to use that all together instead of using current index, because since we're going to be retrieving the point, we don't really need, we're, we don't really need the index value anymore. Okay. So let me show you how that works. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable called uh, current distance. And that's going to be also, again, it's going to be like a number that is going to be ridiculously large. So double dot max value. And we're going to create a point 3D object that is going to be the last point that we checked. And right now, we need to initialize this to some value. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say, for example, from the points list, I'm going to take whichever is the first point. We could come up with a rule with like uh, a point that is like the last one on the list or the one that's more in the center or whatever. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. And we need to remember that we should take that point and we should put it already in the sorted list, which is because it's the first one that we're going to be using. So sorted, we should add from points we should add the first element there. And we should also, from points, remove that, that point. Okay? That's it. So here, what we're going to do is here, pick first point and move it to sort it. All right? And then keep track of the last lo smallest distance. And I think we are now on a good position now to start going over all the points in the list that we got and then create a for loop where we iterate over i is less than zero. Oh, my neighbors are screaming. i is <laughs> i less than zero. i is, sorry, i is equal to zero. i is less than however many points are on the count list, and then I++. Plus plus. And then here, we can say, let's calculate the distance from, um, 
from our current point, from the last point that we found to the current point that we're going to be checking against, okay? And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some code that I already wrote for uh, the geometry gem number four, where we looked at distance between points, uh, and the link of which should be popping up somewhere here, somewhere, somewhere. So let me go and get that code. And here it is. Um, so these are the two functions that I wrote on the geometry num gem number four, where we were discussing this, how to calculate the distance between two points. And, uh, and this is the function that we use for regular distance. But remember, in that gem and in gem number five, when we were cleaning duplicate points, I also discussed how when you are using distance to compare things, well, you're not interested in the actual distance, but you're interested in comparing that distance to other distances, um, it's actually much faster to use the distance squared. Because if, two, if you're comparing the straight distance between two points, then that comparison is going to be the same as if you compare those square distances. And with the square distance, you save a little bit of computation. So if you want to learn more about that, go to those videos and learn why this is, um, this is important. And I'm going to use the square distance to, um, to compare those points. So, um, so here I'm going to say, I'm going to compute the double, the square distance between uh, the distance square between the previous point that I found, so last point, and the current point that I want to check against, so one after the other in the list. So that's going to be points dot i. And if d2 is smaller than the last distance that we found was the smallest, then current distance should be equal to this distance that I just calculated. And um, and uh, and um, oh, I need to add another variable here. Um, and yes, and the index number. So so that's going to be what is it going to be? It's going to be current index is going to be minus one, and then current index is going to be equal to where we are right now. I, okay, and then. Once I finish this for loop and I have checked all those points, what I need to do is I need to say, let me take the point that I found. So um, let me point the point that I found and let's say last point, the last point that I found is now going to be equal to from the points list is going to be equal to current index. And, um, and now, um, uh, and now what? And now I need to take, sorry, I need to take that point. Uh, so let me write this, let's point 3D, uh, the chosen one is going to be equal to that point from the list of points, the one with the current index that I found that had the smallest distance. All right. So when I do that, now I can say the two to the, I'm making this a little confusing, sorry, to, for the sorted list, let me add that point, the chosen one. From the points list, let me remove the point that is at the position that I found at the index that I found was the one that had the smallest distance. And also remember that for the next iteration, I need to make sure that last point, the one that I'm always checking distances again, is equal to this one, the, one, the last one that I found, the chosen one. And also, I need to remember to reset current distance to be equal to a really large number and current index to be equal to minus one. This is actually not necessary, but um, it's good practice to remember that. So let me just write some uh, comments here, um, or I, I'll do the comments offline. So let's see if this works. If I'm write this, if I run this, this kind of works. Oh, and what do we have here? So we have a, um, so let's see what we have here. Uh, let me do this, okay. So you can see that now we have a much more interesting distribution than when we had just like the pure random points where like the polygon was going over and over again, over through all the points. Now, because they are aligned by proximity, you can see that interesting things happen, such as for example, these points here, like being kind of aligned and then it gets into this uh, 
this one here and it's very difficult to trace but you can see how like like the polyline gets here down here but then there's also like this point this is a really really interesting um, distribution and something that happens also you can can you see this very long straight line here what's happening is that probably this is the very last point and as the algorithm was sorting through these points there were very few points left so at some point when the algorithm was here 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 and it had this point probably from the whole cloud the only points that were left were these three here so that's why it had to do this long jump here a similar situation may have happened here where there was a long jump between these two points right because i'm assuming those are probably the ones that are by the end of the check um so um and there's another one here another long jump here but inter but i think this distribution of points is actually uh, it's making things very very interesting um, so so yeah that is sorting points by proximity when the distance is the smallest distance between them something that we could also try right now is to instead of sorting the points by proximity in terms of the shortest distance we could actually force this to um, to create to sort the points by the maximum distance so the ones that are farthest apart and just like it right now this algorithm creates this very nice order yarn of polyline where uh, elements are very close to each other if we choose the ones that are farthest away we could probably create some kind of polyline where the polyline is constantly zigzagging over uh, the most extreme points and then starts slowly slowly uh, con creating concentric um, relations into itself so that could create some interesting geometry let's um, let's try it out and see if, that, if there's anything cool we can find there okay so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to add a new input here uh, that I'm going to call for example uh, by minimum distance and I'm going to make sure that this input is uh, a kind of boolean value so that if um, if this is true then we check by minimum distance but if it's false then we check by maximum distance and then it's going to be as easy as just going into the code here and then saying this is where I'm checking if um, the distance is less than the previous one so this is what I need to say uh, let me check if we are checking by minimum if this is true and and if this is true then d2 should be less than um, should be less than the current distance and if that's true then we do this but we're going to we're going to add here a new line and we're going to do parentheses here um, and because we're going to check by this or the other possibility is that we check well if by minimum is false and d2 is greater than current distance then um, then store that current distance here and do current index here as well now one thing that i need to remember is let me run this code okay i'm going to run this code and uh, i'm going to save in case it crashes because if I do false now, things are not going to work. And you see that something is going wrong here. And it's not going to work because remember that the first initial value that we used, because we were checking for points that had like smaller, 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 smaller distance, we started with a ridiculously large number. But if we were to check by point, points that have like a larger, 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 larger distance, then we want to start with a value that is ridiculously small. So, so what we can do here is we can say we can write by minimum equals equals true and if that is the case then we should use double dot max value otherwise we should do double dot minimum value all right this thing that i have written here in case you're not familiar is called a ternary operator and it's basically a conditional a very simple conditional statement this is just the as easy this is the same thing as saying uh, 
current distance and then writing if by minimum equals equals true then current distance equals uh, double max value otherwise this equals uh, minimum value so this one line of code is exactly the same as these six lines of code that I have written here it's just written in a more concise way if this is true choose the first parameter if this is false choose the last parameter and actually we can write this even more concisely if we just say is this true question mark then choose this value but if this is false then choose this other value here and that we can also move here because we need to reset that right there so if i run this code now and if i turn this to false we get this really strange geometry which is basically like a like a porcupine or like a um, like a sea urchin right and because all points are sorted by the farthest away they are they could just zigzagging they keep zigzagging back and forth over the space in which they are contained which I think is kind of cool too. So sorting by distance doesn't have to be by the minimum, it can be by the maximum. And depending on what kind of sorting algorithm, you get very different results uh, when it comes to, for example, joining them with a, with a polyline, all right? I didn't want to finish this video without actually indulging a little bit in the work that we've done and trying to find ways or situations with uh, where these algorithms are not just for simply sorting points out but there can be some interesting design applications that we can find for sorting these kind of points right so I think the the way we've done things so far by working on a point cloud that is volumetric so all the points are randomly placed inside of a volume in this case the one by one or two by two cube here um, I think this is very interesting, but the result, for example, for the proximity sorting algorithm gives us this like entanglement of like this polyline that keeps getting tangled on top of itself. So it's very hard to see patterns or to see things arising from this volume, from this three dimensional volume. So I think interesting applications, for example, for this, um, for the proximity sorting algorithm could be when instead of applying those to points that lay randomly inside of a full volume we apply those points we apply this algorithm to points that lay randomly on something that is closer to a surface so for example i created here offline um i created here th uh, three geometry situations that i think could be interesting i'm going to turn off the random points and what you can see here is that i created this one cylinder like a simple surface just without the the top and the, and, the, and the bottom and I just distribute it randomly on top of this surface like something like a thousand points so if I turn off the surface you can see that the points still there are so many that they give us the impression of like a surface um, distribution of these points this is very interesting because if I use these points now to um, to generate the proximity the proximity point we can see that the result of this geometry is this kind of distribution of the polyline over um, this surface object because all the points are distributed over the surface but it also gives us the impression of this sort of um, coral growth pattern on top of the surface that I find very interesting uh, a few things to note here for example we can see that if we go on top we see that there are some parts of the polyline that are outliers this is just because when the algorithm is like sweeping over all the points at some point it runs out of points that are very nearby and it has to jump to the next one which might be very far away so it runs out of like local points in its neighborhood that are very close to each other and it has to jump out this is actually much more prevalent especially when it, we reach the end of the polyline so for example you can see that this end here is loose and you can see that if you trace it back you can see that it comes from these three points but there's a long jump here another long jump here jump 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 and there's like another very long jump here which is preceded by this other long jump 
which makes sense because by the end of the algorithm, when we only have like a handful of points left, those points may just be remainders of whatever they were on the surface. Um, so it just it makes sense that this behaves this way. If this is something that we didn't want and we just wanted this kind of like growth um, effect pattern, something that we could do is we could increase or we could implement the algorithm to make some kind of rule where we say if the distance to the next point is over a particular threshold and that threshold could be controlled by a parameter on the component, then just stop the, the polyline that we had and start creating a new polyline so that we instead of ending with one polyline that goes over all the points, we end up with a bunch of polylines that capture the neighboring, like all the points that are in a certain proximity. Uh, this is actually quite easy to implement, um, but I'm going to leave that as an exercise to you, the viewer. So if you actually do that and it come, you come up with something cool, feel free to um, uh, post it here on the comments on this video or in our Discord channel or however you see fit, okay? Uh, but not only proximity, for example, if we do the C height, we can see that the cylinder is now very clearly sort of like sliced in uh, vertical layers. If we change this to the X property, for example, um, we can see how like also the, we have this sort of like uh, vertical slicing of the, um, of, the, um, of the cylinder, which I find very interesting. Uh, very similarly, I, uh, instead of a cylinder, which is a little boring, I created also this kind of napkin surface. It's just basically a loft between two curves, on top of which I also distributed this um, 1000 random points. If now I use these for the distribution, we can see also a nice pattern that is arising out of, oops, sorry. We can see how this polyline is sort of tracing the curvature of the surface. Yet we also get, like we said before, we also get these big jumps between points. So you can see, for example, here, it looks like this is the end of the polyline and we can see like all the big jumps that it had to do before ending, right? Whereas where we start, which looks like it's here, it's like very smoothly, it's just like a lot of continuous points all across because it has a lot of points to choose from. Um, we can, for this one, we can also do C height and then we're basically, it looks almost like a topography representation of this surface. But if we do X, X is very cool because it actually gives us this kind of like hairy <laughs> sort of uh, uh, representation of the surface, which I find interesting as well. Um, and last but not least, I also brought in here the Stanford Bunny. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is a very common model that is very popular for doing mesh processing operations. It's, a, it's an open source model. You can download it from a repository online. And, but it's very commonly used for mesh operations. So whenever um, you find on papers, you find a, a, uh, somebody describing an algorithm that performs some kind of operation on a mesh, on a geometric mesh, they very often use the Stanford Bunny as uh, the standard model that everybody checks meshes operations against. I don't know why it got popular for mesh operations, just like the Utah teapot got very popular for uh, 3D rendering operations. But anyway, what's interesting about the bunny is that because it's a mesh, at the end of the day, it's also internally, it has all these vertices, which if we isolate without the triangles, they also form a point cloud. And this point cloud is the point cloud that you would get by 3D scanning an object, for example. Um, but it's also, you can see that if you rotate, you can perceive how those vertices are sort of arranged on top of a surface that is not regular, like a B, like a nerve surface anymore. It's the surface of an object. Um, but it gives us this impression of this volumetric impression, which again, if we plug into our proximity sorting algorithm, we can see that now the polyline is describing this sort of volume of the bunny. And it's almost like it's, again, it's like this growth pattern that is growing on top of the surface with these jumps that are also happening due to the algorithm running out of proximal points, right? Um, similarly, X, uh, the X distribution, this looks almost like we're 3D printing, like, wait, wait, let's do that with, let's see, 
it looks almost like a really bad 3D print, right? Like a 3D print that went wrong. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it's very interesting. So I think that visually, all the possibilities that these algorithms give us are very interesting. And that's why I think they are worthy of um, talking about them and spending some time and exploring the creative um, challenges and the creative opportunities that they give us. So I think that's about it for this gem. Um, something that I would like to remind you is that we haven't really, when it comes to sorting, sorting is one of the fundamental principles of how to, how people understand and how people write better algorithms in computer science and in programming. Because sorting is an operation that because you have to keep checking every element against all the others, uh, it tends to be an operation that can be expensive. So there are multiple algorithms and multiple ways of doing sorting out there that try to address the problem of optimization and writing fast algorithms that can compare things against each other. We haven't gotten into that topic here yet uh, because it's a huge topic to address. I was just more interested in getting something quick uh, that works and that is reasonably performative. Uh, it's reasonably performative in our case because we were always checking one against the other and removing one. So instead of checking everything against everything every time, we were checking at increasingly decreasing sizes, which creates a triangular distribution of checks that makes, um, that makes the computational time basically half the time of all the elements that we have multiplied by all the elements that we have. So instead of, if we have 1,000 points, instead of making 1 million checks, we were roughly doing half a million of those checks. Uh, but if you're interested in better ways of sorting things. Um, I recommend you go online and there's like a lot of tutorials and algorithms that you can check. I was more interested in the geometrical implications of what criteria we choose here to sort these points and how visually it's actually very different to choose, for example, to sort them by proximity. So very close distance to sort them by proximity as in very far, very fast distance. And what kind of designs you could do with this um, and how, how, what implications this could have for 3D printing or for drawing geometry or for creating mazes, that's absolutely up to you. All right. Um, so thank you very much for staying here and, um, and I hope you join us uh, for, the next, for the next gems. Bye. Oh, and if you like this, remember to subscribe and to like. That's, that's very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.